Easter. The remarkable part about Bethel is not its white building with bright red doors or its stained glass, but its people and the way God has knit us together as part of the larger body of Christ and enabled us to adapt to new challenges. The people have a great ability to make use of resources. The presbytery worker, synod consultants, national church staff, past members who are gifted in business or finance. In 2004, we were trying to meet the needs of children in our church, and Bev Jordan, elder and chair of the Christian Egg Committee, enabled us to receive a grant from the PCC called Inviting Space to fix up our nursery for our throng of little ones, as many as 16 or 18 in the nursery on a Sunday. A parent attended a conference about the first five years of faith, and a simple program was designed for our nursery-age children of song and stories. Children and babies were warmly welcomed to worship. It was often loud and joyful at the beginning part, with baby bottles and goldfish and snacks, and babies passed down the pew and toddlers moving around. The session thinks about children and youth in each decision they make. A few years ago, children were welcomed into communion. And recently, the offering was moved to the beginning of the service to allow youth to participate in taking up offering and allow families to give their offering together. Although this did disrupt the standard flow of the service, we decided that God would understand. This country church also has a passion for mission. In addition to a superintendent, the Sunday School has a mission coordinator, Elder Ruby McKenzie. She focuses on local and global mission projects for children and youth and challenges the adults to follow suit. Recently, she led a Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies Day where kids learned about pws and programs. The Explorers and COC groups have enjoyed the PCC Afghanistan Children and Youth Study, made kites and raised money for school kits. The AMS groups continue to support all of this and to educate us and challenge all to be generous in mission. Mission happens by monthly donations to the food bank, special offerings, support of Presbyterian sharing, and pws and Central Church, this is a picture of the current building. It was built in 1975. We're not a large congregation. We have about 150 people who associate themselves with us. We get about 65 to 70 out to worship uh, on a Sunday. It's a very busy place. We have three congregations, a couple of daycares, uh, many groups that use it. The building is in use from 6 in the morning till 10 at night, seven days a week. But it was not always that way. About 15 years ago, the congregation hit bottom. Uh, they, these are, uh, not to dwell on the negatives, but I think some of you will recognize at least some of these characteristics. Um, we're in preservation mode. It was an aging white congregation, resisting change very much focused on keeping the Presbyterian culture. Uh, the Within the congregation, of course, the standard things, we're so small, et cetera, et cetera. But there was a strong desire to continue, and there was a heart within the congregation to do so, uh, and a passion to do that. And the so key we, in all of this, though, was a change in the focus within the congregation. It was a change from all we have to survive to know we are going to be alive and we are going to thrive. And thriving as opposed to surviving is, is absolutely key. Out of this came an understanding that the congregation needed to be relevant to the community in which it found itself. And it sounds obvious, but it's, it's absolutely foundational to understand that. Now, a bit of a sidebar on intercultural success. We had a relationship with Galilee Korean. Uh, it's a congregation of uh, Western Hong Kong. It started, oh, about 15 years ago. And it was the 
classic kind of, of immigrant church renting from an existing settled congregation. And it had all of the characteristics or the, that are exhibited in many of those situations. The reason for doing it, of course, was financial. Central needed the money. Galilee needed a space. And it led to the, the usual irritations that uh, arise in these situations. From Central's point of view, there was a lack of respect uh, regarding time and noise and property, insufficient financial support and participation, and irritations from the Galilee Korean side were that we were rigid and inflexible and that we were all about business instead of gospel and that they were being nickeled and dimed to death. And as so many of these relationships wind up, it was a disaster. We had the end. But the key principle now is not landlord-tenant, it's we are co-workers in the kingdom of God. This is a shared minister and responsibility. And it's a success story, it really is. It's Here is a growing city of about 140,000. And my, my thought is that our church is like many of yours. Um, we can sometimes fall to a sense of um, sappy sentimentality. Um, sometimes we um, worry about not having enough money in the bank. But I'm here because there is a good sense of renewal and some great things happening. And so just to get you up to speed, um, as to get a feel for the flavor at Westminster, I'm just going to show you a bit of a, a video that will uh, hopefully um, help you get a sense of, of what we're about. The church had seen the tombstone. And friends, let me tell you, nothing motivates for change like the smell of death. Um, the church was literally a couple months away from uh, closing, and uh, by the grace of God and by the um, faith and dedication of a few key leaders, uh, the church pulled through. And I can't really emphasize that enough because uh, when I talk to some other congregations too, that's, that's really significant. Um, there's a sense that, you know what, there's no really other alternative because if we don't do something, uh, we'll be doing nothing. So that was really important. And so although no one said it like this, there was a spirit in the air. And I was kind of encapsulated by this Einstein quote um, I want to share with you. The significant problems we face today cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. The health of the minister. And this is really, really important. Edwin Friedman argues that the nature of the leader's presence, their emotional health, and their ability to communicate and take care of themselves is a major factor of influence in any organization. But we very rarely, if ever, talk about it. We live in a time of high anxiety for pastors. There are pressures of being at the center of organization to perform, please, and produce at all times and to bring a word from God every week. The health and well-being of leaders is hugely important. The congregation realize that if I am healthy and well and strong, it goes better for the congregation. Especially in so many of our congregations are this pastoral size model, and that's between, 100 and, that's between 50 and 150 people. 
Uh, you're in the middle of most stuff, and so if you're healthy, it goes better for everything. There's a ripple effect, and the same happens if you're unhealthy, spiritually, emotionally, physically. But I think the new front door of the church is no longer a slab of wood on hinges, but it's a www dot. Um, one of the things that we found at Westminster, especially in Barrie, it's a growing city, um, and there's a lot of these great things happening. Uh, we noticed a pattern, and I started talking about people and started monitoring what was happening online. And uh, most of the people who come to the church have first checked out the website. When people are looking for a new church, what do they do? They go to Google. And so we realized that that's the new front door. And so with a little bit of money, you can, not very much, you can set up a website. Uh, we start engaging social media, um, Twitter and blogging. I blog for myself and for the Presbyterian Record. And realize these are ways to engage people uh, with their faith and their life throughout the week. And uh, like, why is Facebook so popular? Well, it's the new front porch. So I started in January 2007, and there was only one thing on the agenda for that year, and that was to wrestle with the question, who are we? And so that is uh, our Easter service of that year, where we launched the process, Community Under Construction. And that after six to eight, nine months of discussions, we established a very clear vision statement accompanied by core values. Who are we? The second shift was in the area of mission. This congregation had very little connection with the wider community. We uh, went to a Ken and Callahan workshop, loved it, were uh, kind of just chomping at the bit to get there, and we knew we needed a, a legendary mission. On the way to the workshop, a building on Main Street had just come up for sale that had belonged to uh, an elder who had died, and it just had 10,000 villages written all over it. Um, to make a long story short, uh, we bought the building and then went to 10,000 Villages Canada and said, we'd like to form a partnership. So uh, that was our first legendary mission. For those of you who aren't familiar with 10,000 Villages, it is a store providing fairly trade items from artisans around the world. I think our approach to mission is unique. It's all about partnerships for us. We're too small to do it by ourselves. Um, we think in this era it's all about bringing down traditional walls and making connections. We have raised tens of thousands of dollars for our projects from outside of the congregation, $30,000 to initiate the 10,000 Villages store, $50,000 to date for Reaching for Rainbows. We have a large circle of mission pro partners, including the Creative Children Ministry Fund of the Presbyterian Church in Canada and the Experimental Fund of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Here are some barometers for success. Last year we welcomed 12 new members. Six more have arrived since January. Dozens of people participate as volunteers in the 10,000 Villages store. Dozens more in the Reaching for Rainbows uh, initiative. Average worship for uh, uh, average worship attendance on Sunday has gone from 30 to 50. But let me tell you, it went down first because when you are establishing a new identity, it is not going to work for everybody. All right, but we ensured that those people who were not comfortable, no longer comfortable within our community, found other worshiping communities with which they felt much more comfortable.